Well, good afternoon and welcome back to everyone. Um, it's good to be here again. Remember, my name is Ruth Sylvester. I'm a volunteer instructor with Global Healing. Today we're going to talk about um, process improvement. And process improvement is that last um, building block in the base of our um, bedrock here for good manufacturing practices. The what we've been doing as we've gone through these over the weeks, we've been laying the foundation for good manufacturing practices in, in a quality management environment. And by laying a good foundation as they did with the Parthenon, um, you then have the um the the setup for a process that is in control and the whole purpose of good manufacturing practices or the goal of good manufacturing practices uh, it's better to say is actually to have a process that is in control and that limits variability because variability is what introduces um, risk so today we're going to talk about performance improvement, this last bedrock of um, the bottom. And the topics we're going to talk about in um, uh, performance improvement, we're going to look at what specifically is performance improvement, how do you do it, um, the Plan, Do, Check, Act, or PDCA, which is a... a um, uh, an easy... Um, um, tool that you can use for implementing performance improvement and then we'll look at some of the other performance improvement tools that can help you improve the operations of your organization. So let's get started. So what is performance improvement? Performance improvement very simply is making things better but using a problem-solving approach. Um, it addresses the true problems and not just the symptoms. Remember in a previous session we talked about where you wanted to address the root cause. Well, performance improvement helps you identify causes, helps you reduce variation, and eliminate non-value added activities. Non-value added activity is something that you're doing, but it adds nothing to the process. Performance improvement uses a structured process that walks you through, and it's based on collecting objective data, analyzing that data, and using objective data to um, uh, as the basis for your improvement activities. So how do you do performance imp uh, Im improvement? There, there are many names um, for performance improvement. Um, there's total quality management, there's continuous improvement, there's continuous quality improvement, again performance improvement that we're using here, very um, high level performance improvement activities include Six Sigma and Lean. Um, we're not going to go into that because you're at the beginning of your journey and so you start using very basic techniques and you capitalize on the success of using those techniques, and then you move forward. If you try to jump all the way into Six Sigma and Lean, um, you end up spending, in my experience, as much time on the process and not on the actual implementation. Whereas if you start basic, then you can get, and um, some very early wins and you can get the ball rolling. Um, I think it's important to try to get early wins and to see success to make it successful in the long run. Now performance improvement philosophy um, is that, and we discussed this in earlier sessions, it's the same thing in root cause analysis. Most problems are system and process problems. They're not people. And yet, people are the ones that get blamed most of the time. If you improve quality, um, you do that by removing um, the problems and the variations, again, within the system. Um, 
just doing that, just eliminating the variability in the system will lead to improved productivity and reduce uh, errors. Staff know the process better than anyone. You must include staff and in the process improvement activities and efforts. They're the ones that are going to do it. They're the ones that know the process the best. And so if you include them, one, you get buy-in from them as to why you're making changes. But two, um, you actually understand what's going on, on at the, the worker level. And then more can be accomplished by working together to improve a system. Again, it's a system. Um, than having individual contributors working around the system and, and trying to fix it. Um, it's a team effort, and it's very, very important that you um, uh, approach it as a team effort. Performance improvement, again, uses a structured problem-solving process. Um, you don't have to create a, a very complex process um, and problem-solving process to capitalize on um, the wins. But the one I'm going to show you today, it relies on graphical so uh, problem-solving techniques. Remember I said in uh, previous sessions, in several of them, and that is um, I'm, I'm a big, big proponent of flow charting, that if you can't flow chart your process, you don't understand it. Um, what graphical problem solving techniques allows you to do is understand exactly where you are and and what variabilities exist in your process as it is today it also lets you grade the relative importance of problems to be solved um, because many times there are many problems but you can't attack them all at one time you have to um, plan out your attack because even while you're trying to improve your process you still have to keep the the doors open the lights on and and um, the operations going and then whether changes have made um, um, you need to uh, evaluate whenever you put and um, uh, implement uh, proposed changes because you you want them to have the desired effect. Sometimes you implement something and you may think um, scenario A is going to happen and when in fact something else does. Um, and and that's just, it happens. That's why you need to monitor any changes to see whether or not those changes were successful. So this is just a cartoon, a graphical representation of the plan, do, check, act. The plan, do, check, act. It is a circular process. It is something that you go through um, and then when you solve something, then you start on another one. So you start with the, um, the plan process. Um, you select a process to improve. That's the first one. And you try to narrow it down um, and, and take chunks of, of a process. Perhaps it's easier just to look at one little piece than to try to fix the whole process. So you select what it is, what process you're going to um, improve. You're going to organize a team and that team must include um, subject matter experts as well as the um, people at the bench level that are doing it. And then you want to flow chart your process. Again, you want to lay it down and we'll go through how you actually flow chart. I'm sure many of you already know, but we go through the basics of it. You collect some baseline data from the way your process is today, and then you plan your improvement. From plan, you then move over to do, because you've planned your improvement. Now you test the change. You carry it out in a small scale. Um, to make sure that it's going to work correctly, you collect data to test it and you compare that data from what you had in the baseline to see whether or not your um, actions worked. Then um, you review uh, the test and you analyze the results. 
And then finally, after you've done that, to prove that the proposed change is going to work, then you implement it full scale um, and finalize it. You take action on the test results, and then you implement your successful changes. Then you're back up to plan. Once you've done your um, plan and you've implemented your changes, you'll continue to monitor, but then you go and you pick another process to improve, and the cycle continues. So the PDCA, the plan, do, um, check, and act. This is a... Um, uh, um, diagram of the uh, performance improvement methodology just flow charted out. We do have this um, translated into Georgian. It is available for you in a um, in a document, and it is a 14-step process. Again, this is simply a flow chart process of what. Um, we showed you in the previous slide. So here it is in, in a diagram. Here it is in a flow chart. Now, let's move to the next uh, slide. And what we're going to look at is, again, some more graphical techniques. We're going to go through several different techniques that can help you. Um, this is a, a looking at the same thing, the exact same thing, um, but in a little bit different form. Again, you have problem identification. You flow chart it, you check, you have check sheets or brainstorming sessions and nominal group techniques. These are all techniques that you can use to help you identify and define your problem. Then you collect data. Um, you, and you can do that uh, very simple data collection techniques um, and anal uh, analytical techniques are run charts, Pareto charts, cause and effect diagrams, and stratification. And then you analyze it um, using histograms, scattergrams, control charts, and process capabilities. And we'll look at these now. So let's look first at a flow chart. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that um, have not used uh, flow charting before, um, flow charting is nothing more than sketching out your um, process. It's just doing it utilizing some standardized techniques and standardized uh, diagrams. An oval is either a start or a stop. A square or a rectangle, rather, is a process step. A diamond is a decision. That's where a decision is made. Whatever your documentation is, uh, you list it here in this format. If you have to continue on to another page, you use an off-page connector so that um, it would go here and it would say connect to A, and then you would further look further down in your process to connect it. And then this, here's another connector where you go from page one to page two to page three. So very simple uh, flow chart here. Your, chart, your process starts. You have a process step another step, another step, you make a decision, you have either option one or option two, you follow through what that, the options are um, with other process steps, and then you come back with the final process, and then you end. A very simple um, um, example of a flow chart. Flow charting. You want to draw a flow chart on what steps the process actually follows. And this is why it's so important to have the people doing the work be part of the flow charting. Because if you as a supervisor or leader, you may chart what you think is happening versus what actually is happening. Then the next thing you do is you draw, you flow chart out what steps in the process should you follow. What is the ideal? When we're looking at um, streamlining, if we go back up to the little flowchart we have, the more decision points you have and the more branches that you have to follow, the more complicated your process is. So a goal is to streamline your uh, process as much as possible and um, remove the variability, uh, and by doing that, you remove as many decision points as you can. You can't get rid of all of them because there always will be decision points. 
but you try to streamline it as much as possible. If your flowchart goes off on a tangent and goes through all of these steps and then comes back in, um, if it adds no value, then try to eliminate that. You compare the to what you're actually doing with the what you should be doing the ideal you compare the two and the differences you're doing what's called a gap analysis you're identifying where they are different and it helps you to identify where problems may arise so as you look at your process you're looking for differences and high risk points Now, when you want to start doing data analysis or data collection, um, some very simple techniques for doing that. One of them, and probably the simplest one, is simply a check sheet. It's an easy to understand form and answer how often something is happening. So you can have um, problems, let's say, problem A, problem B, problem C, and these are days of the month, and then you look at how many times each one is happening, and then you simply total it up. Very easy, very simple um, uh, data gathering technique. You can take the data that you see here in table form, where you have to look at all the columns, um, and then an easy way to try to figure out which one of your problems is happening the most often, and it's called a Pareto chart. A Pareto chart is simply a graphical representation of data going from highest to lowest. It's very easy to construct, and it gives you more bang for the buck. So that while, oops, sorry. So while here, I can look at it and I can say, okay, problem C, I only have 10. Uh, it's 50% of what my problems are, then I go down to six and I go down to four, or I can very quickly say, oh, A is, A is uh, obviously uh, my biggest problem, B is, uh, you know, the next. So if just looking at this chart and I'm looking at um, trying to plan what I want to work on next, then in this chart, just based on sheer volume, I would say that A has a very, you know, um, high likelihood that maybe I should take care of A first. But this is only looking at it one-sided. This is only looking at how frequently something happens. There are other th ways of um, looking also. Um, one is going into um, a cause and effect diagram. This is a diagram, and we looked at this before. We called it the fishbone diagram. We looked at it when we were doing um, uh, deviation management. It's a diagram that represents a relationship between uh, some effect, something that happens, and what potentially causes it. It's strictly a um, visual way of trying to identify um, what are the root causes? You're looking at the big four, method, manpower, material, and machinery, and then administrative areas, and the big four could be policies, people, procedures, and uh, facilities or plant. This is the fishbone diagram um, that we showed. Again, it's looking at method, material, manpower, and machinery that's leading to this effect. So the effect we know, and so we work our way backwards to see what's causing it. And remember a very simple technique we discussed the last time, and that was five wives, um, the five whys. Now, another way of um, analyzing data, uh, we saw just a simple tabular form. We looked at a Pareto chart, which listed by order. Um, here, we're looking at the data. It's called a run chart. We're going to look at the data, and we're going to do it over time. So this is where we have time across the x-axis, frequency of something happening on the y-axis, and you plot it out over time. And then what you're able to do is draw an average on here. Obviously, something happened in the third quarter that made whatever event in this picture um, uh, occur. Another example of a um, 
simple uh, plot chart. Um, we talked about the Pareto. This is a histogram. And this is not looking at from highest to lowest, but looking at um, repeated events which produce result over time. So here um, the looks at variability and we have our variables here at the bottom. Um, and this as you can see would be similar to the normal bell shape that we expect when um, from uh, just random variability that exists. These are several different types of histograms based on the data. Um, the very first one would be a normal. I would expect when I plot out a histogram to get a normal distribution. You hear that mentioned oftentimes. You can get a skewed data where your data is skewed to one side or the other. Here you'll see that my mean and my average is skewed to the left and the tail is drawn out. Um, you can have a lot of variability. This is just showing it's the same thing. It's your normal distribution, but the numbers are much higher. And then here you have very small variability where, you know, you, you get out here and you're not seeing as much variability on the tails and it all seems to be centralized here in the center. So just different types of histograms um, that show you um, different, uh, different things. Uh, another type of plot is called a scatter diagram. Scatter diagrams look at a relationship between one variable and another. You plot one variable on the x-axis, another variable on the y-axis. You plot your uh, data on it to see if there is a relationship, a possible cause and effect relationship between the two variables. You can't prove that one variable causes the effect on the other one, but um, it certainly is a very easy way of, of a very quick way of looking. When I have data, um, when I'm first starting data analysis, the first thing I do, I just throw it up on a chart um, and I look at it visually versus tabular. Um, I don't find, I find tabular very hard to look at and to try to interpret. You should always plot your data. Um, and uh, this could be time. This could be um, hemoglobin and deferrals. It could be any number of things and looking for uh, impacts. So X will represent one measurement, Y the other, and then you just plot your, your pieces. Now, taking your uh, control chart is a um, very specific type of run chart. It's a run chart with, with uh, statistically determined upper and lower limits. We use control charts when we um, plot our quality control data. Um, it, it is looking at plotting data over time and comparing it against statistical limits. If you have fluctuations of points within the limits, you would expect that because just in any normal process, there should be, there will be some variability in it. Um, just randomly, there should be some variability in it. Any fluctuations outside the limits um, are special cause and they're not part of the process. It is great for showing shifts in trends over time. Um, Here's one you see, a run chart. Um, statistically, 5% um, of um, results will fall outside of your normal. You'll see your control limits that are set up here. These would be the 95 confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals. So just the, that means that 95% of the points should fall within these two. Um, but randomly, you're going to get some that just falls out. Where you get co concerned is when it falls uh, way, way out, or you see um, some shifts and trends. This is a trend where you have five points going in one direction uh, versus you're bouncing up and down. And then this is a shift. If my mean would be here, all of a sudden my mean has shifted up. So those are two um, 
types of uh, run charts you see with a, um, a lot of times where you'll see a trend like this happening, either your reagents or perhaps uh, a light source is starting to lose uh, its effectiveness. When you see a specific shift like you see in this one, again, that would tell me that there's probably a calibration issue going on. Uh, something that has changed, um, made a significant change in your testing process. So keys for success um, when you're doing performance improvement. Always strive to improve. Um, Im improvement is never, it's not a destination. It's not somewhere you get to and you're done. It is a, an ongoing uh, process that um, it never ends. You want to focus on customer satisfaction. And we have many customers in a blood center. Certainly, to me, the ultimate customer would be the patient that will receive the transfusion. But we also have donor centers. We have hospitals where our customers are. We have wards that are transfusing our products. We may have other blood centers where we send our uh, products to. Um, if we are a testing center, we may have uh, received samples from another testing place, uh, from another collection center, uh, and they would be a customer. The competent authorities are a customer. Um, and, and so there are many customers. You just have to think outside the box um, and then try to focus on them as you go through your performance improvement activities um, so that the ultimate question is, how do I improve it for my customers? And then the ultimate goal of all performance improvement and guard, uh, good manufacturing practices is to build and to maintain consistent, reliable processes and systems. That's the ultimate goal. And when you're constantly striving to achieve that, you will always be improving um, your processes. And it doesn't matter what you call it. Don't get lost in the terminology. Um, don't get wrapped around the axle, um, that it has to be, you know, we, again, right now, Six Sigma is the current uh, um, buzzword, if you will, in the United States, as is lean. But if you're doing TQM or CQI, and if you're doing it consistently, you'll eventually get down to these other levels and then uh, involve everyone. It, it's absolutely essential from two reasons. One of them, if you don't involve the people that are, that are um, actually doing the work, um, you're not going to get buy-in because you're going to change um, what they're doing and they're not going to understand why you're doing it. Uh, and two, you may not understand your process as much as you think you do. And I think that is the last slide with this one. Now, um, these sessions are pre-recorded, as I previously mentioned, and I will be available uh, at the end of the session to answer any questions you may have on performance improvement. Thank you very much.